What's up everybody? Uh, we're gonna do a couple minutes of reruns here. You know the drill. What's up everybody? I saw this photo and the header, the mysterious prehistoric underwater structure beneath Lake Michigan, and I was seriously waiting for the punchline. But it's not a joke. They really found this at the bottom of Lake Michigan. And I bet there were some heads spinning about how they're going to explain this one. So I'm going to read the article and we'll talk about it a bit. <laughs> so this is up at the north end of Lake Michigan in this snake tongue looking bay here called Traverse Bay. That's about 11 miles wide at its widest point. And check this place out. These are some of the little bays that are coming off of that Fort Tongue. But these are pretty crazy. I didn't know these existed up there. <laughs> I w you probably don't see it quite so dramatic at ground level. They spend about six paragraphs talking about anything but what's going on here. Then finally, about 40 feet beneath Lake Michigan, Dr. Holly discovers stones arranged in a long line over one mile in length. Now, there are multiple structures that were found, so I'm not sure if the one in the photo is the one that they're talking about here. They're not very clear about anything other than it's there. And they say the stones have been dated to approximately 9,000 years ago, which is 4,000 years before Stonehenge and 2,000 years after the Ice Age. So they have to go with this 9,000-year story to make it fit into their timeline and everything's always happening over millions of years. But then they just start downplaying it. He says the site seems to gain life in media about every six months or so, but sadly, much of the information out there is incorrect. For example, there's not a hinge associated with the site because the stones are relatively small when compared to what most people think of as European standing stones. So he's downplaying these because they're not huge. Well, I mean, this is right along with Napta Playa and the Spanish stone hinge that came out of the water during a drought a while back. Only this is 40 feet under Lake Michigan. And because of it being that far down and how old they're saying it has to be, well, then they have to play the hunter-gatherer game, especially because this is back in the time of mastodons, which, yeah, there were still Native American tribes that hunted wild game a couple hundred years ago, and then there were also settled, like the Cherokee were more of town folk. Plus, don't forget the Mississippian culture that had these huge mounds that they built, which Natives say was built by giants. And then they double down and say it could should be clearly understood that this is not a megalithic site. Yes, but it was built by intelligent thinking human beings that did this for a reason. So then they change the subject for a minute and we'll get back over to here. But they say that John O'Shea, University of Michigan, had been working on a similar structure over in Lake Huron. Okay, so now you're telling me that there's man-made structures all over the Great Lakes, all right? Oh, but they're not that big. Don't don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, they're worried about losing their jobs. Uh, over in Lake Huron, they say the main feature known as Drop 45 Lane is the most complex hunting structure ever discovered beneath the Great Lakes to date. So now you're telling me that there are multiples of these structures. This one being more complex than the others. The structure consists of two parallel lines of stones that lead to a cul-de-sac lined with natural cobblestones, so a keyhole shape. Wow, it is located 37 meters underwater. That's 100 feet. That's a huge difference in the landscape if it's 100 feet or less water. This locality, compromising only 8 hectares, they're downplaying it more, has an unusual high density of confirmed hunting features, including at least four V-shaped hunting blinds, and a rectangular construction that, following ethnographic parallels, may represent a meat cache. The stone lane is 8 meters wide and 30 meters long, and it has three associated circular hunting blinds that are built into the stone lines and a series of perpendicular flanking lines on its west side. The interior of this lane is covered with clean sand to a depth of approximately six centimeters. So how is it we got, you know, a, a stone slab that was obviously on flat ground and they built up stone walls on each side of it. And it's now under the Great Lakes with only six centimeters of sand over it. But 
other sites on dry land are buried in 40 feet of mud. <laughs> They've started scrubbing this from the internet, by the way. But uh, seriously, with this having such a light layer of residue on it, I would think that the water's coming up gradually. You look at the video I did on the woolly mammoths that are all just tangled up in a big ball of muck. They got hit with a solid wall of tsunami mud. But if that happened here, then we'd never even know that this existed. If you're new to my channel and haven't watched the videos about the Earth catastrophe cycle, you should probably watch some of those, especially the 14th century one. Because, well, the world got wiped out about 700 years ago, and they tell us it was just the Black D, but like two-thirds of the population was gone. So why are there no megalithic structures in North America? And I know about the Montana dolmens, which are questionable whether or not those are man-made or not. But every other landmass in the world, you have unquestionably man-made megaliths. Even on a tiny island a thousand miles off the coast of Australia, you have Nan Madal, which is unquestionably a man-made city. I even asked this to a buddy of mine who's not too big into the catastrophism theory. And even he said, well, they must have got wiped out because that's the most logical answer. So these are all basins where large amounts of sedimentary material can be found, which is pretty much all of North America. I mean, even the flat spots up in the Rockies are covered up. This is what the pyramids at Teotihuacan look like just in the early 1900s. They were completely buried under a layer 10 foot thick. And for the people that still haven't figured out how they used to dig footings and whatnot. A shovel worked as good 100 years ago as 2,000 years ago. And they've dug out all the pyramids of Mexico, Guatemala, all Central America. And I don't buy the story of these gradual cultural layers happening here. This is out in the desert, at least with our modern climactic conditions. But I was out walking ruckus down by the river the other day, and there's this old 1800s footing for a house and the chimney's still there and it's in pretty thick woods on the bottom side of a hill where erosion would carry any mud down to it and it's still a usable chimney and I'm guessing it still will be in another 200 years and 200 years after that because things don't get buried under 10 foot of debris for no reason but all of the ancient structures of Central America were the world's largest pyramid at Cholula is still almost completely buried, and they put a Catholic church at the top of it, pretty much guaranteeing it will never be excavated. And I theorize that a giant wave went over pretty much all of North America, burying everything from the ancient past, and it wasn't quite so bad down in Mexico and Central America. And if that's the case, then this was built after the pyramids at Teotihuacan and the Great Lakes formed after that was built. Otherwise, all of this would be buried in muck as well. Okay, so here is a list of the main characters, Static Dakota Ring Alpha, uh, the Kooks, the Tatarians, Gelandia, the Alliance, which is just the Allies, and the Internationals. Now, it's important here and going forward in videos to understand that the internationals were funding the Alliance and the Kooks. Trotsky had shown up in New York broke, and six months later, he had $10,000 cash and all of the traveling papers he needed to go start a revolution, all courtesy of Wall Street and the internationals. So it was the same people behind both sides of the Cold War that was really just to fleece the citizens of each of the major countries and then used as a pretext and justification to go invade all of the smaller colony countries around the world. Think Vietnam. We had to stop the kooks. Ultimately, it doesn't matter if some little country gets taken over by democracy or kookiness. It's all part of the same beast system. Now, Gelandia had kicked the internationals out of their home. So even though America and Tataria are supposed to be mortal enemies, you know, freedom versus the tyranny of the kooks, all that went right out the window when the internationals got kicked out of Gelandia. And all of a sudden, we're best buddies when it comes to having a common opponent. See how that works? And then as soon as Gelandia fell, then we're back to being continental nemesis.
a couple other things I don't want to repeat over and over. Wanting and then Krieg. And then just add a thousand years to whatever date I say, because on the scan it reads as ancient history. We're talking about the events of 941 AD here. So I got a comment on the last video, and I wish I would have screenshotted your name. But thanks for the comment. This is something that I should have explained and that everybody should understand. But I've seen the pictures of those people starving in the camps. Yes, we all have. That's why I'm not going to... Well, not the only reason, but I'm not going to show more here. But yes, we have all seen the pictures of people in a severe state of wanting. Just emaciated, skin and bones, and a horrible condition, man. I don't want to see that for anybody. Wanting away is just slow, painful, grinding agony. And I've even heard about the GIs that saw them, wanted to help them, and the physicians were like, nope, you cannot feed them, they'll gorge themselves, and they really had to be nursed back to health. Now, this is always shown and presented as, see, look at the G-landias, they're soulless monsters, and they were trying to eradicate an entire people, the greys. Okay, now let me tell you the things that they don't ever bring up when they're talking about any of this, especially towards the end of the Krieg. First off, let's do a little geography refresher. A camp was right there, and all of the facilities were basically spread across Poland and Glandia there to the left. And then to the right is all Tatarian. Ever since Dub Dub won in 918 AD, almost 30 years before the time we're talking about now, this was all Cookville. The Kooks controlled it. Now, we're going to start quite a while before the outbreak of Dub Dub Deuce, but this will just give you a taste of how world affairs went at this time. In 933 AD, millions of Ugaranians were off in a man-made famine engineered by the Kuk government of Joseph Stalin. Mm -hmm. The primary victims of this extreme wanting were the rural farmers and villagers who made up roughly 80% of Ugarain's population in 930 AD. Scholars estimate that 3.5 to 7 million people took a trip to Valhalla. And the sadistic thing about this is it was the small farmers that were wanting. The people that were actually able to grow all of their own food and subsist independently nope they came and took their land livestock farming tools and said nope you got to work on the corporate farms now and of course before people are demoralized to the point that they will want to death there were thousands of uprisings that were dealt with with extreme prejudice by the kooks the irony is the hammer and sickle is meant to symbolize the unification of workers and farmers when in reality, they convinced all of the workers that the farmers had it too good and therefore they needed to be knocked down a notch. So by promising the workers a step up the social ladder, they were able to eliminate the peasantry, intellectual, and cultural elites. And then everybody was on the bottom rung. There, there's your equality. They always promise that somebody's going to move up in life when re in reality, they're just knocking everybody down to the lowest level. Now, this was about a dozen years before the end of the Krieg, but I just wanted to establish that the kooks were willing to disincorporate up to 7 million of their own people to accomplish their ends. Now, let me clarify some things, because we've all been taught that Glandia was ran by a madman that wanted to conquer the world. Well, here's a newspaper clipping from 939 A.D., October 20th, and they're loving this. Just listen to him. A.H. is bristling at the rejection of his peace offer to London and Paris. A G. Landian says, England and France have rejected our hand in peace. They threw down the gauntlet, and now we've taken it up. The truth is, A.H. tried on multiple occasions to avoid a Craig with the Alliance countries. The internationals didn't like that because they saw Glandia as a threat to their international monopoly. So they bought up Craig mongers like Winnie Kirkle that had to drown his conscience in a couple gallons of booze every day to saber rattle and convince everybody that the only solution was a Craig. 
So just so you know, Glandia wasn't trying to conquer the world and the whole Craig could have been avoided. Now, let me map this out for you. The aerial bombardments from the Alliance nations started out all the way over in England, and as they gained ground throughout France, they slowly were moving eastward. They'd pick up new airfields and be able to reach further into Glandia. So by November of 43, they were able to reach into this zone here, and then by June of 44, they could reach all the way over here. And that's really all they like to tell you about this. We're the good guys and we won. But simultaneous to this, this is known as the Western Front, the Tatarians were running in on the Eastern Front. So basically, Glandia was surrounded as soon as the Alliance countries hit mainland Europe. The Eastern Front between the Tatarians and the Glandians saw more KIAs than in all the other theaters combined. The Pacific the European, the African, all didn't add up to the Eastern Front. This map is showing April of 945 AD, and A Camp is somewhere right around here. Now, how well do you think that supply lines were running during this time? Especially when railroads, bridges, highways were all high-value targets, meaning those are the first things that they're going to hit with all of these flights that are coming in. Yeah, things probably weren't running like clockwork. On top of that, in most parts of Europe, the number of livestock, cattle, sheep, pigs, poultry, and draught horses had fallen substantially. Even in Britannia by 944 AD, both pigs and poultry had been reduced to about half. So what you're not supposed to know about all this is that not only were those who had been encamped severely malnourished but the general populations of nearly every european country faced a food crisis by 945 a.d there was a famine in the netherlands and the uk and rationing didn't end until 954 a.d that's nine years after the end of the craig so by 945 a.d there were widespread food shortages so when were all of those pictures taken that we've all seen January 945 AD. Now, I don't know how many of you think that if there was a food shortage in your town that you would prioritize the campers, but I seriously doubt that you're going to find me anywhere on earth where that would be the case. So I'm not saying that it's right that those people suffered, but honestly, how's it not to be expected in this scenario? Also, the Tatarians were closing in from the east, driving everybody out of that area. And you, you should really need to, if you've never seen it, you need to see the documentary Hellstorm. And then you'll understand who the real soulless monsters were out of this, the Tatarians. I can't even begin to describe it here, but you can find that over on the Green Machine. But while the Tatarians were pushing to the west, they just stumbled across a camp. They knew nothing about it being there as they approached. So how long had it been since the Glandia crew had bugged out? Well, we don't know, and it was the Tatarians were the first ones there. And while we're here, this flyer perfectly illustrates the relationship between the U.S. and Tataria. When it comes down to it, they're both allied and mobilized on the same front, for a common goal because the same internationals are behind both of them. But as soon as that's accomplished, then each one of them tells their citizens that the other one is the biggest threat in the world to them. And this is still going on today, just so you know. Things like the space race to where, you know, it's just a way of getting untold trillions of dollars out of the pockets of the people. Okay, some other facts about 945 A.D., uh, yeah, just look at this. Tens of millions of people were without food, but we don't ever hear anything about this. It's just all about those certain people because they're important. These other tens of millions, I don't even worry about them. We're just going to ignore the up to 20 million, and we're going to focus on this couple of thousand lapidical prisoners and tell everybody how evil Glandia is. Better yet, we're just going to tell the world that they had a hunger plan with plans to want out 
30 million people, but it never materialized. They, they wanted to, but it didn't happen. What did happen, though, is the requisitioning of occupied areas, the land that was taken back by the Tatarians. Well, then there were 4 million people. So it, this really does just get infuriating studying this stuff because they literally always accuse your enemy of that which you are guilty. That is the, that's what they always do. It's just insane. It's just black is white, left is right. And I've even shown how to some of them it is virtuous to swindle or off a Christian, a Westerner. Now, of course, not all greys believe this. It's just the Babylonian holy bookers. But they are the ones that are in a position to carry these things out. And then when they get caught up for their BS, then the blame falls on all greys. So if I were a gray, I would want everyone to understand that we're not the same group. There are two totally different factions going on here. And by handicapping anyone that is trying to explain this to people, then it's just a setup for a repeat of the where innocent people do AD get blamed era. for the actions of animals. And those animals did use food as a weapon and caused some of the worst atrocities in human history, but you don't hear anything about them. It's all about just the couple thousand people that were in these facilities. So, yes, we have all seen those pictures. But the truth is, they weren't just withholding food to make people suffer. There was no food anywhere. All the supply lines were cut. We don't even know how long it had been since the Glandias had bugged out of that location because the Tatarians were coming. Glandia was not trying to conquer the world. They had kicked the internationals out because they had come into their country and started a stock exchange and took majority control of all of the industries. They took over finance. They took, I think, two-thirds of the government positions and were attempting to implement their kooky ideology. In the last video and several others along the way, I've shown that they were not just rounding up greys. They were going after kooks and kook leadership that just happened to be grey. And here's a question for you. If these facilities were just set up specifically for fumigating people, then how were they there long enough to be found wanting anyway? Sorry, but 95% of everything you've been told about this is BS. If you go and try to create a coup in any country that makes millions of people there suffer, don't expect to be treated like a king when you get caught up. So now you know the rest of the story that they don't want you to know. Static out.